Yeah, so it's it's a stressful day, hectic day. The sun is scorching so hard. And we're just here, yeah, there's coconut. Uh, just to um, help me ease in. So we give you a tour to this awesome place. Yeah, so just wait. Let me finish my coconut from here. I'm going to get some food. Who said so? I understand, yeah. So thank you. Stay tuned. Just as we said, this is the place, and I think we are starting from this place. You see, this is the male slave dungeon. So we can just uh, come in with us, and we have this wonderful man here. Uh, he will tell us his name, and he will be our guide for today. So he will tell us his name, and uh, then he will show us around. So, All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. How are you doing? I'm fine, sir. All right, my name is Harry, and I officially welcome you to the historical Cape Coast Castle. I'm going to be your guide. I'm going to show you around. The tour will take us about 45 minutes. And then throughout this 45 minutes, we shall visit the male slave dungeon, the female slave dungeon, the condemned cell, the punishment cell, the courtyard of the castle, the door of no return, the door of return. Finally, we'll move upstairs, see the Palava Hall where auction took place. From there, we'll bring our tour to an end but before we start with a tour i'm going to give you a brief history about the castles we have in ghana and then the transatlantic slave trade on the west coast of africa and so basically in ghana there are three castles dotted along the coast of ghana we have saint george's castle in elmina which was built by the portuguese in 1482 we have the second one in accra that is a christian bog castle built by the Danes in 1661 and then finally we have Cape Coast Castle built by the English in 1664 and so out of these three castles Elmina Castle or the St. George's Castle it is the biggest and then the oldest European trading post in sub-Saharan Africa Cape Coast Castle where we are at the moment this is the smallest among the three however Cape Coast Castle itself it was once built as a fort known as the Karilosbeck Fort by the Swedish in 1653. The fort was named after King Charles of Sweden. The fort itself changed hands severally between the Swedish, the Danes, the Dutch until the English captured it in 1664. So it was the English who developed the fort into a castle status as we seen today. So Cape Coast Castle, as it exists today, it was built over a period of 300 years. It wasn't built at a go, but rather it was built in stages before the whole edifice was fully completed. The land on which the Cape Coast Castle sits on now, the land itself has changed hands severally between the Portuguese, the Swedish, the Danes, the Dutch, until the English settled on this very piece of land so the british were the last european nation to settle on this very piece of land the transatlantic slave trade on the west coast of africa it all started at a time when the spaniards got to what they called the new world upon getting to the new world gold and silver mines were opened sugar tobacco cotton plantations were established in as much they wanted the wealth from the new world they were not prepared to do the hard labor and so they subjected the natives to do the hard labor due to european diseases such as measles influenza smallpox whooping cough many of these natives were not surviving they needed to get people to replace the natives and so one colleague missionary by name bartolomeo de las cascas he suggested that blacks taken from africa should be allowed to work in the plantations in his opinion he said africans they were doing the same work under similar climatic condition in africa for that reason blacks taken from africa should be allowed to work in the plantation so somewhere around 1512 they took a couple of black people from spain to espanola that is present day dominican republic others also says they were taken to santo domingo that is present-day Haiti. 
That is where these enslaved Africans were tested on the plantations and true to Bartolomeo de Las Cascas claim, each and every one of them proved physically strong, which made the demand for black people rise. And thus began the unfortunate story of misery and pain, the false exodus of Africans from their motherland to the world unknown, which is known as the transatlantic slave trade on the west coast of Africa. We will begin the tour from this side. We'll be moving down the flow slopes. It's a bit slippery in here. Let us take our time whilst we go down. Okay. Wow. We'll still move down and see what's inside the male dungeon. But I just wanted to show you something. This is how dark the place was. The open space up there was the only source of light and ventilation for them. It was more darker as you see now because the main entrance will be shut down. Once the main entrance is shut down, the whole place was very dark. But let's keep moving. If we do it, Tiana. Yes, this is where captured enslaved African men were held. This very dungeon, it was designed to hold as many as thousand men in here for a period of time. When the whole place is full to its capacity, thousand men were kept in here. They were not allowed to move outside. They decayed, renated, vomited. They sat and slept around their own mess. But then the whole idea wasn't meant for them to eat themselves on the ground. But then they used to have wooden buckets or receptacles just at the corners for them to ease themselves. Oh, okay. But because they were not entering this wooden bucket on a regular basis, it sometimes get full. They were left with no option to ease themselves on the ground. They slept on a bare floor. Others were sleeping on top of the others. So for where each individual stood, it was a complete apartment for them. There was nothing like light as you see now. The whole place was very dark. And so because they were kept in darkness for a very long time, whenever they had the opportunity to step outside, the sun rays affected their eye. Many became partially blind whenever they were exposed to the sun. That is the only source of light and ventilation for them. Wow. They were fed twice a day in the morning and in the evening, but for whatever that it was given to them to eat, it was never meant to satisfy them, but in just to sustain them whilst they were in here. In 1974, some students from the University of Ghana, from the archaeological department, they came in here to conduct a research work. But when they got in here, they wanted to understand the reason why the floor, it is as solid as you see now. They took sample away, they conducted several research on it, and after several research being done, the result or the findings that came out was that what you see on the ground now contains human feces, blood, vomit, leftover food, saliva, urine, tears that has been mixed up together, which it has solidified and then turned into black as you see on the ground now. So what do you see on the ground now? This is not the original floor of the dungeon, no. The original floor of the dungeon itself, it has been covered with the remains of the captives. Wow. Let's see something from the side. So what is the difference between this floor and where we just left? Oh, okay. So with this, you can see some of the bricks. Yes, yeah, so the, br the bent bricks you see on the ground, that is supposed to be the original floor of the dungeon. The excavation work was done in here. And so when you carefully look at this very portion, you see this, exactly. this portion is exactly what we saw over there. Yeah. So after the excavation work, this portion was just left just to tell people that this chamber was once like this. It was as a result of the excavation work mm. done in here. That is how come in here we are seeing the original floor of wow. the dungeon. 
And so all these rooms you see in here, these rooms are sacred rooms where the souls and spirit of our ancestors are still in here. If you have good eyes, you can see them. If you have good ears, you can hear them talk. They are not here to harm us. They are only here for us to experience what they went through. The Catholic Church started from the Elmina Castle. The Presbyterian Church also started from the Christian Borg Castle in Accra. The Methodist Church started from this castle, just at the courtyard of this very castle. And then finally, the first English Church or the first Anglican Church, also known as a Society for the Propagation of the Gospel, SPG Church, also started from this castle. The English Church or the Anglican Church sat just right above the male slave dungeon. Above this very dungeon, there is a church sitting comfortably above this dungeon. So while there were others up here claiming they were worshipping God, singing praises to God, preaching love your neighbor as yourself, there were others just right beneath them, dying and suffering. The big question we need to ask ourselves is that why should they even build a church on top of a slave dungeon? When you visit the Elmina Castle, the Dutch had their church just right above the female slave dungeon with a quotation Psalm 132 verse 13 which says that Zion is a lost resting place and there he will stay forever. And so indeed, if we truly have heaven and hell, perhaps they are trying to teach us about the concept of heaven and hell. Either than that, I personally do not understand the reason why others must be up here claiming they were worshiping God and then there were others in here dying and suffering. That's crazy. Let's keep. Okay. first chamber where we stood on the original floor in here we are not standing on the original floor of the dungeon these are the remains of the captives covering the original floor of the dungeon as you can see this part of the chamber it is naturally brighter as you compare to the remaining chambers from this very point not everyone is going to continue with a journey from this point they need to separate the weaker ones from the stronger ones the weaker ones would have to stay in this room for doctors or physicians in the castle probably takes care of them for the stronger ones to continue with the journey and so after the sorting has been done the stronger ones wouldn't move back towards the main entrance they would have to exit the dungeon through an underground passage behind this very wall there is an underground passage very big and then very wide, about 70 meters from this very point. Only the stronger ones would have to make their way through the tunnel. They walk through till they get to the door of no return, where the women can join them. They all move straight into the ship. The tunnel has been blocked by the British. In 1833, we cannot make our way through this tunnel. However, when you step outside, we'll get the opportunity to see how big the tunnel is, where exactly the tunnel ends but from this point I'm sorry we can't go through from this point but these are flowers or wreaths also in here brought in here by Africans African Americans people from the Caribbean they brought them in here to pay homage to their ancestors to our brothers and sisters who lost their lives during the trade they mostly bring these flowers in here during Pan-African historical theater festival that is Panafest or Emancipation Day. That is when these are normally brought in here. In 2019, Ghana celebrated the year of return, yeah. of which many of these were brought in here by our brothers and sisters in the diaspora. We're going to talk about this shrine. Um, first of all, one would ask why we have a shrine inside the milk dungeon. In the olden days, before the Europeans had not introduced Christianity to Africans, we as Africans, we had our own way of communicating to the Supreme Being. We communicate to the Supreme Being through natural tongues, like stones, rivers, mountains, trees. It is all because we as Africans believe that the ancestors and the deities are more closer to God than any other person. The gentleman you see over here, he's a priest. He takes care of the shrine. He most of the time pray 
for people to see in order to be able to help us give a better explanation when it comes to the traditional way of communicating to the Supreme Being. So he's going to pray for us to see. And then let us be observant. Let's observe everything he does. And then from there, I'll explain. I'll give you more details about it. Okay, so when he clearly observing what he was doing, after he had poured the palm wine into the calabash, if we're clearly observing, he first of all raised the calabash up, and what he said was that he was calling upon the Supreme Being, the Almighty God, to bless it before he pours down to the deities and the ancestors, just as it is being done in the churches. Before the priest gives out communion to the people in the church, the priest would first of all have to raise the communion up, he asks God to bless the communion. He takes the communion just to prove to everyone inside the church that it is safe to take in. That is exactly what he did. He called upon the Supreme Being to bless it. Later, pours the stone you see up there, that is the deity. He pours some on the deity. He pours some into the pot for the ancestors. He was supposed to pour it on the ground, but it's just that probably he doesn't want to wait to the ground. That is how come he poured it into the pot. And so he was calling upon the deities. I believe you understand me. Exactly. So you understood what everything that he said? I understand. Yes. So he, he, it was just a piece of prayer he offered for us. So all that I, I want to put across is that before the coming of the Europeans, this is how we Africans communicate to the Supreme Being. It was never the Europeans who introduced God to Africans. Okay. We Africans, we knew the existence of God. But as to what God is, or as to what form God is seen, we cannot tell. But we believe that the natural things surrounding us, the stones, the rivers, the mountains, these things were done by the Supreme Being. Let us pray. Let us communicate through distance. The Supreme Being will hear us. So this is how we Africans communicate to the Supreme Being. Okay, so can I ask a question? Go ahead. So if you, can, if you see the, the stone that is over there, the, there is money on it. Uh, is it done, like, was it done before, like, when you come to worship, you have to put something there? So, the money you see up there, it is normally placed there by people who visit the castle. There are some other people who visit the castle. They are not, they are, they, they, they are not Christians, they are not Muslims. They believe in this type of worship. We have hot liquor, we have palm wine up there this shrine needs to be t taken care of. And so normally people will come in here, help in probably taking care of the shrine, in buying the hard liquors and the stuff. So people, some of these monies are donated by visitors who come in here just to get some of these drinks and maintain the place as you see. Okay. Okay. That's fine. I think uh, it's been educated to uh, our next but then before I do that I would want to uh, put something on there so that right. I hope uh, do I have to do any special thing or I have to just put it there right, put it there okay. Okay. so if you heard uh, this place was basically a worship room that's why we will uh, we'll put it let me try and okay. clarify something okay when the captives were in here, okay. this wasn't here. This However, was this shrine was on this very land before this edifice was built. Oh, okay. After the Europeans succeeded in acquiring the land from the chiefs, they were denying the local people from worshipping from this side. So they performed their sacrifice. This shrine was taken out from here to 
to another place. It was only brought back when the trade ended in the castle. So meaning when the captives were in here, this wasn't here. It was just an empty room. This was brought back after the trade ended. Let us talk about this plaque very briefly. This plaque was unveiled by the former president of the United States and then the first lady Michelle Obama on the 11th day of July 2009. Michelle Obama traced her ancestral roots to this very castle. Okay. That is how come the whole family decided to pay the visit to the castle. So this has been unveiled out here just to tell visitors that President Obama and the family has been here. There's another plaque at the other end. I want you to take a photo of it and then later I will explain that plaque before we end the tour. Okay, so let us talk about these graves, but I don't want us to be in the sun. You see, out here, it was, it was a graveyard, or a cemetery for the Europeans. We have four identified graves out here. The very first one separated from the three. He's the only African buried in here. His name is Reverend Philip Kwaku. Reverend Philip Kwaku was born in Cape Coast here in 1741, a native of this very town. Philip, together with two other coastal boys, that is William and then Thomas. The three coastal boys had a scholarship from Reverend Thomas Thompson. Reverend Thomas Thompson, he was the then leader of the Anglican church inside a castle. So the three coastal boys were taken to England. The whole idea was to train them to become missionaries. It was so unfortunate in England, the two boys lost their lives in England. Philip studied in England alone. He was the first African to be ordained as an Anglican priest in England. He later returned back to the castle, worked in here as a reverend minister, and then also succeeded establishing the castle schools for the mulattoes. Philip died in 17th of October, 1816. Philip was the one who introduced formal education in Cape Coast here. And so the name Philip Kaku has been given to some schools within Cape Coast here. And so when you visit Cape Coast as of today, the name Philip Kaku has been given to some schools within the town. Um, let me just try and give you something briefly about the name. You see, in Ghanaian settings, names are given to people according to the day they were born. Yes, yeah, so if you're born on Monday, you will be called Kojo. If you're born on Sunday, you will be called Kesi. Philip was born on Wednesday. He is called Kweku. But it was because the British couldn't pronounce Kweku properly. The name moved into Kwaku. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so because the Europeans, they anglicize many of our local names. We just came out from the male dungeon. Above the dungeon, three windows above the dungeon was a church. The first English church or the first Anglican church I made mention of, sitting just right above the male slave dungeon. People sleeping around their own mess, sleeping around another one's mess. The church is actually built on top of that. Exactly. But the remaining three days were these are European graves. The very first one up here, an army commander in the castle by name C.B. Whitehead. C.B. Whitehead died in 1812. Cause of death was unknown. We don't know what exactly killed C.B. Whitehead. And then the third one at the extreme end, that is Captain George McLean. McLean was a Scottish born on 24th February 1801, appointed as a governor in 1830. It was McLean who ensured the closure of the tunnel. In 1833 when the trade ended in the castle. He also succeeded in bringing the Fantis and the Shantis together to sign a peace agreement in order to fight again. McLean also helped in designing the bond of 1844 which was signed between Commander Hill and then the eight Fanti chiefs. McLean died in 1847. Then the last one in the middle, a lady by name Leticia Elizabeth London, Captain George McLean's wife. Leticia traveled all the way from England to this castle in 1838 only to visit the husband. But two months after she made it to the castle, she was found dead in the husband's bedroom holding a bottle. Nobody knew what exactly killed 
Leticia, but then rumors, gossips in the town had it that when Leticia made it to the castle, she herself realized McLean was having an African mistress by name Ellen Banama. Out of jealousy, out of frustration, she decided to poison herself. Others also believe that Ellen Bannerman came in here, she posed herself to be a servant in the castle, later conspired with McLean, and then together they poisoned Leticia. And as I speak with you now, we still cannot tell what exactly killed Leticia. But then the fact that she was found dead, she was holding a bottle, the bottle contains an acid. It could be that she was poisoned by someone, or she decided to poison herself out of jealousy and in frustration. She died in 1838, two months, three months, sorry, two months after she made it to the castle. Like I said earlier, the tunnel has been blocked. We can't make our way through the tunnel. But this side will give us an idea how big the tunnel itself looks like. So from where we have the shrine, that is the entrance to the tunnel. This side only served as an observatory, a soldier, needs to be out here with a gun. All he does is to make sure everyone moves down into the ship. So from here we'll see the end of the tunnel. But please remember, not everyone, nobody entered the tunnel from this side. Nobody came out from this side. The only way one could enter into this tunnel was from the male danger. That is the only place you can enter it. So from here we'll see the end of the tunnel. So this side was, is only to give us an idea how big the place looks like. So let's see the end of it. Men needs to join the men in here. This side will be the final exit into the ships. But sometimes the waves from the ocean was sometimes very rough. So this side has to be blocked off. After the side was blocked off, they later created the door of no return, where nobody went through that door and then came back into the castle again. So this was the initial exit into the ships. Very soon we'll see the door of no return. This is a cell, a punishment cell for enslaved African women. Officials in the castle, when they left Europe for Africa, they never came to Africa with their wives. And so whenever there was a desire for them to have sex, they were left to no option to abuse the enslaved African women. Those of the women who resisted rape from the officials, they were beaten up severely and then later locked in here for a couple of days. A very huge metal gate covering the side. Food and water was only given to them through the side. There is an open space in here that is where they had to defecate and then renate. So those of the women who resisted rape, they were the ones locked in here from 7 to 10 days before later they were released back into the den. So basically the whole idea of this cell was to just to frustrate the women so that whenever they wanted to abuse them, they can easily have their way through. This side is a female slave dungeon. This is where captured enslaved African women were held. The women had 
two separate chambers. This side is a very first chamber. We have the second chamber just opposite us. Each chamber held 150 women together with their children in here. They were also not allowed to move outside. They defecated, urinated, vomited, had their menstruation in here. They sat and slept around their own mess. The three rows up here, that is the only source of light and ventilation for them. Whenever the governor wants to rape or abuse any of the women in here, the governor comes with a servant. They stand right in front of the door. The governor looks through and then points at any of them. The servant then comes in and then pick her out. She'll be taken to another place where she'll be given good food to eat, put on nice attire, take a nice bath. From there, she'll be handed over to the governor. After the governor is done abusing her, she'll be brought in here back again. But then as time goes on, if they realize she is pregnant, they will still have to come for her. The British had stone houses within the community. That is where many of these pregnant women were taken to. Enslaved Africans who went to this door lost contact with Africa. They lost their name, they lost their identity whilst they went through this door. The door itself it wasn't big as you see now. It was very short and very narrow. It was designed in a such a way that only one person From wherever that these enslaved Africans were captured along West Africa, they would have to walk barefooted to their castles. On the way to their castles, some of them lost their lives because of inadequate food and water. Others fell into traps. Others were attacked by wild animals. Those of them who were found sick and weak, they were left on the way to the castle. Only few people made it to the castle. The few who got to the castle alive. Once again, the conditions in the dungeons, it wasn't the best. Many died in the dungeons. Those who survived the dungeons came out here. They had to go through this door. They went through the door. They saw the ships. They saw the Atlantic Ocean. They never had an idea as to where they were taking them to. So some of them voluntarily decided to jump over into the ocean so as to prevent themselves from going to the known destination. All right, so once the captives walked through this very door, from this very point, the ships were already parked at this point, where we have the canoes being parked. This is where the ships would have to land. But this part of the beach, it is very shallow from this side. Bigger ships were not moving closer. Bigger ships would have to dog 70 to 100 meters away from this side. They convey the captives with smaller boats to the bigger ones, and then the journey continues from that very point. From this point to the Americas and the Caribbeans, took them two to four months before they could reach the Americas and the Caribbeans. The floating caskets the Europeans refers to as ships had names like Jesus, Glory of Africa, God is Able, Brotherhood, Liberty, Hope, Santa Maria. These were names for slave ships. Door of Return. The same door has been named as the Door of Return in 1998 when Ghana first celebrated Emancipation Day. Two bones of two enslaved Africans were brought from New York and in Jamaica, representing the people of the diaspora, that is Samuel Carson and Madame Crystal. They flown the two bones down to Ghana. When you are traveling from Accra to Cape Coast, there is a village along the way called Abanze where you can locate Fort Amsterdam just up on the hill. From Accra to Abanzi, they traveled by road, but from Abanzi to this part of the castle, all the crew decided not to travel by road again. They will only continue the journey to the castle through the Atlantic Ocean. But why through the ocean? It is because the ancestors were taken to the Americas through the Atlantic Ocean. If the descendants of the ancestors are returning back home, there is a need for them to also use the Atlantic Ocean. They got here, a very short but a very impressive ceremony was done just right in front of the door. 
and after the ceremony the two bones were ushered through the door of reality and that ceremony was very symbolical the meaning of that ceremony means the chains has been broken and for that matter our brothers and sisters in the diaspora should now return back to their motherland again let us not forget the black americans they are not white people they are not from america they are all from africa it is because of the injustice that occurred in here that is how come today they find themselves in the americas and the caribbean so the door of return is to bring back home our brothers and sisters who left this very shores and never returned back to the motherland again these are some of the reasons why ghana celebrated year of return in 2019 the whole idea is to bring back home our brothers and sisters so later the two bones were reburied at a cinnamon song slave market where the captives took their last african bath This is a cell. It is not an ordinary cell, but a condemned cell. It looks as if the punishment given to the men inside the male dungeon wasn't enough. They still went ahead to create a condemned cell, enslaved African men who fought for their freedom. While they were in the castle, they were seen to be stubborn, aggressive, rebellious. They were all locked up in here. Nobody went through the side and came back alive. Less than 72 hours in here, nobody came to survive inside this very cell. Very soon, moving, and I'll explain to you what before then. All the fittings, all the doors we have inside this castle. This door is the only original door left inside this castle. A little above two centuries. It is made with pitch fine timber from the front. At the back, it has been covered with copper. And so, if this door could talk, it could tell us more. Here. So let's move in, let's see what is in here. Please keep your face down. Alright, so this is from game seal. There were three doors leading to this side. A two in the middle has been taken off. Left to the last one. Even the last one. Thank you.